So I'm going to draw the center line for the next two graphs, and you can finish them off. The center line is at 2 higher than it used to be, so now the center line for that graph is here. Okay. In the cosine graph here, the center line is 1 lower, so it will be here. Okay, so again, see if you can get the pattern. You should be able to trace out sine and cosine fairly quickly. So as you finish, you can double check your work against mine. We should have the same picture. Okay. So there's the two transform graphs that moved up and down. Okay, so so far that's the only thing we've had to deal with is we moved the center line. Okay, so let's... Uh, start adding some extra transformations in. So uh, let's use our transformations knowledge. Let's talk about what's happened for these graphs here. Okay, so for these two, let's just talk about one of them. Transformations was a pretty good unit for us. I think we can probably just review on one. Anybody tell me what's happened to the, the graph on the left here? Sure, go for it, Kara. Yeah, exactly. We would have wrote down vertical stretch equals 2, and we'd go up by 1. So one thing you're going to notice today when we work on trig transformations is I'm going to give you a set of tools that deals specifically to the trig graphs. Now, that's not to say that if you totally forgot these tools that you wouldn't be able to do what we did in first unit. It's just now that we're more specific, we might as well learn some shortcuts to those specific graphs. Okay? So if for some reason you're thinking, why are we doing this differently than first unit? It's not because the first unit won't work, it's because we can do it faster because we're talking about two specific graphs. First unit was any graph, right? So for this first one, we would move up by two, uh, sorry, it would be vertical stretch two and up one. Okay, so we've already said this is going to move the center line up by one. What do you think is going to happen in terms of, use some trig language, what's going to happen to this graph if the vertical stretch factor equals 2? Sure, go ahead. It would have doubled amplitude. Exactly. So vertical, stretching it higher, that's going to change the amplitude of the graph. Okay, so now we're going to have amplitude of 2. So that's the connection we wanted to make. Okay, so in this one, we would have um, vertical stretch factor of a quarter. Uh, sorry of a quarter, and we'd have a center line at negative 2 because we've moved down by 2. Okay. So now that we've added these two pieces to it, something in front and a center line, well, we already know the center line is whatever number is there. The amplitude, um, the only thing you got to be careful with is, remember I said it earlier, we don't necessarily care that it's negative, we just want to know how far it's moved. So it's actually going to be the absolute value of that number. So if it said, for example, negative 5 sine x plus 1, that negative 5, we'd still talk about amplitude of 5. Okay, We don't care that it's negative. Just like in transformations, remember we didn't say it has a vertical stretch factor of negative 5. What did we call that if it was a negative 5 in transformations? What did the negative do to the graph? It added a reflection. So that's all we would talk about this graph with then, is we would say it's been reflected and has an amplitude of the same number, 5. Okay? So the amplitude doesn't change if it's positive or negative. Okay, so the pieces then for the first one, center line, it's always a good place to start. It gives you a, a reference to begin your graph. Amplitude is 2 in this graph. So with an amplitude of 2, that means the maximum is going to be two units high. So instead of being here, I'm going to move up two units. Back to the center, then down two units. Back to the center. Okay. 
So this graph is twice as tall as the normal sine graph, and it's been dropped by one for its center line. Okay, so amplitude two, amplitude two, here's our graph. Okay, so I'm going to let you try the next graph, three cos x plus one. Okay, so the first one, uh, I again always start with the center line, a nice reference, so it was one higher, and it has an amplitude of three, so that means it's going to start up here, touch the center line, then drop down by three, touch the center line, rise by three. So this is one cycle of that cosine graph, and I can complete it. So there's a complete graph. Okay. How are we doing so far? If uh, this is the worst transformations in graphing, it would be a five, and if it wasn't so bad, it's a one. So where, where are we at right now? Can I speed up or slow down, or what should I? We're doing okay? Okay, that's good to know. So horizontal translations when we move the graph, um, I believe the physics people stuck us with this, um, but we call a horizontal translation a phase shift, okay? So when you hear the word phase shift, or the words, I guess, phase shift, what they're telling you is how much it's been moved left or right. Okay. So that's what we're going to work on now is we're going to see how this phase shift uh, changes the graph. And normally we do graphs like sine x plus 2, and you'd be able to tell me, oh yeah, that moves left by 2. Okay. But because we're working with the trig ratios and pi is all over the place in there, you'll even notice that the scales are in terms of pi. That's why usually you're going to be moving it like pi to the right. Okay, so it might seem a little bit weird that we're talking about pi, right? We'll figure out later how to make graphs that are scaled to, you know, days of the year or something more practical. But at the very beginnings, we use pi a lot. You'll see it in the, uh, the equations a lot too. Okay, so for this one, this would be a left by 3 pi over 2. And anybody remember the trick here before you start? Yeah, good. Remember, before you do this one, the first thing you should do is put it into standard form. Otherwise, you may have trouble seeing the actual transformation. Okay. So now I can see that it's right by 3 pi. It's not moved 9 pi. So if we wanted to talk in general about this graph, where we move it, we have a phase shift. Okay. Um, what I'm going to call this phase shift is the starting line. Okay, So you'll see it makes sense when we graph it. It has a starting line. Right at that spot. So let me show you uh, in this first example here why it makes sense to call it the starting line. So what I was saying to start with, we should always do a center line. Okay, that's a nice place to start. What would the center line be on this first graph? It's not a trick question. <laughs> yeah, it's a zero, right? When it's not there, it's a zero. So we'd find the center line at, at zero, okay? Now, before we want to graph this, we need to know where should I start? It used to be that we started here because we didn't move the graph, right? This graph stayed at the or right on the origin, right on the y-axis, because we hadn't moved it. But now we're dealing with the graph that has been moved. So that's not the starting line. Okay? It's been moved pi to the left, so that means my starting line is going to move pi to the left. So I have those two little lines in my rough work to remind me where this graph starts. And this is a sine graph, so it will start at the center. It, it has an amplitude oops, it has an amplitude of uh, a half, so that means it will rise by a half in the first spot. Oops. Okay, so um, it has an amplitude of a half, which means we'll find that first key point will have moved up here by a half, back to the center line, then down by a half back to the center line, up by a half, and then down to the center line. So this would be a good start to that graph. And again, I can keep going with the pattern in the opposite direction to finish it off. 
And that's what I would look like if I shifted the graph over uh, and had an amplitude of a half. So you try doing the phase shift and the amplitude for the second graph, which is three halves, cosine x plus pi over 2. Okay, so uh, again, I always start with a center line. This has been moved pi over 2 to the left. So here's where I'll find pi over 2 to the left. Now I know where the graph starts, so I can start talking about cosine. Cosine starts at its maximum. The maximum for this graph will be 3 pi over 2, so I'm right at the top. Then I come down to the center, then I come down to the minimum, back to the center, maximum, center. So one cycle, well it's more than one cycle, but I can get that much of the graph um, on the right side of where I started, and I can finish off if I keep the pattern going on the other side. Okay, so that's what I should see for that graph that's been shifted to the uh, left by pi over 2. Okay, so the last thing we need to talk about in transformations is the horizontal stretch factor. Okay, so if we think about it, there's really a four pieces that we've been talking about for the, um, the trig graph. So we've been talking about center line, the phase shift, where the graph starts, um, and we've also been talking about uh, the amplitude, right? And there's one other thing, which is how big the graph is, it's period. So what do you think the horizontal stretch factor is going to mess around with out of all those things? Yeah, it's going to be the period, right? It's going to be how much this graph is stretched or shrunk. So that's what it affects. And let's take a look now at some graphs just to see how this works. So I'll show you. Uh, I'll show you a couple graphs. Like for example, if I do y equals sine of x. Oops. Okay. So there's y equals sine of x. Uh, maybe I'll zoom in just so you can see it a bit better. So let's go from 0 to 2 pi, um, negative 2 to 2. Okay, so there's one cycle. Now, if I instead of having sine x, if I end up putting in, for example, 2x, now I ended up with two graphs because the horizontal stretch is a half. That means I make its width, instead of 2 pi, it's shrunk to a, just pi. So you now see that there's two black graph, or for every red graph, there's two of the black. Okay? It's cycled twice in the same amount of space. So if we were to look at that in terms of the graphs here, if we did a five, now normally I'd get us to do it on a graphing calculator, but we're kind of tight on time today, um, the period would become two pi over five. In this example, we'd see two pi over three. Horizontal stretch factor is one third. The period is normally two pi. One third times two pi. That's how I get two pi over three. Okay. So again, here the horizontal stretch factor would be three. Normally the period is two pi. So two pi times three is six pi. Okay. So what do you think? What's the period going to be for the sine of one half x? Just four pi, right? We don't we don't worry about the negatives the length of that period will be 4 pi. Okay? Negatives, again, we would think of them as reflections. We don't need to account for them in the pieces. So one handy formula for you to work with is if we have this graph and I apply the horizontal stretch factor, it will have a period that is 2 pi over that number b. Okay? 